Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama. You know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can okay it unless it goes through London. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish and um, what's happening today. Hello and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. There is now and forever what we know as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe. 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance stone. and I think we made it by 53% if I remember correctly for going in and ever since that time England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European and that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. Good afternoon. Can I remind members that social distancing measures are in place in the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus, and I ask that members take care to observe these measures, including when entering and exiting the Chamber. And please only use the aisles and walkways to access your seat and when moving around the Chamber. The first item of business is First Minister's questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As schools across Scotland prepare to break up for the summer, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for all they've done to support young people in extremely challenging circumstances over the last year, often with little or no help from this government. Three weeks ago, Three weeks ago the First Minister told this Parliament she had full confidence in the SQA. It's now being scrapped. What happened in that time to change your mind? First Minister. Well, firstly, as I did on Tuesday in this chamber, can I reiterate, uh, with no equivocation, with no snark attached to it, can I just say straightforwardly uh, a big thank you to teachers, uh, to all support staff in our schools, to parents and to young people. This has been the most difficult year any of them will ever remember, uh, both professionally for those who work in our education system and for those who are learning in our education system. I can never find the words to thank them enough, but uh, I, I hope everyone uh, knows how deeply appreciative everyone in the Scottish Government, and I'm sure everyone across Scotland is, for everything they have done. Um,
sometimes, and it's, it's one of the things, the longer I'm in politics, uh, uh, I'm going to be candid here, Presiding Officer, uh, the more frustrated I often get at the inability of our uh, political discourse, and we're all responsible for our political discourse, to engage in nuanced arguments, arguments that are not just binary, black or white. It is perfectly consistent to say that in terms of what the SQA is doing, uh, this... We'll hear and the also the minister. inability to take serious issues seriously in our parliamentary chamber. Um, I do, I, I do have confidence in the work the SQA is doing around the certification of national qualifications. And I think that's important, not just for me to say, for my assurance as First Minister, but it's really important for me to say that uh, for the benefit of young people and their parents right across this country. Um, and I say that again today. Uh, but it is also the case that I think there, uh, the time has come and we have accepted the recommendation of the OECD in this uh, respect and of course the Education Secretary made a statement in this chamber earlier this week to say that it is time for reform and therefore we have given a commitment uh, that we will consider carefully the nature and the detail of this uh, but we will replace the SQA uh, and we will also remove the inspection function from Education Scotland. I think all of that taken in the round is how people, whether they agree or disagree with every decision this government takes, is how they would expect a grown-up, responsible government to behave. And that is how this government will always conduct itself. Douglas Ross. There is absolutely nothing grown-up or responsible to claim you have changed your mind on the quality of the SQA because of an OEC, OECD report that you haven't just had for the last three weeks. This government have had it for months. Absolutely. They had it before the election that we've just been through. And of course, that damning OECD report criticised the confusing and unhelpful communication given to schools. And is it really any wonder? Nicola Sturgeon says she had full confidence in the SQA, so she scrapped it. It's just another example of a government that has lost its way in education, that says one thing and does another, with no real vision of where they're going or how they get there. This is the final chance in Parliament, before courses start next term, for the First Minister to give young people and teachers, who face so much uncertainty over the last year, a clear answer. Will there be traditional exams next year? First Minister. I'm sorry if the complexities of uh, these arguments are uh, sometimes a bit uh, challenging for Douglas Ross in this chamber. Uh, but most people listening to this will realise that for a First Minister to say, as I have done and as I will repeat again today, uh, that I have confidence in the SQA's work uh, around the certification of qualifications this year. And that's a really important message for every young person uh, waiting on their grades. And of course, young people will be uh, getting their grades over the course of this week and uh, into tomorrow. Uh, but there is time for reform uh, more generally. And we are reflecting on the arguments that have been made across this chamber and, of course, on the report of the OECD. Um, and we have come to a decision that it is right now to move ahead to replace the SQA, but to do that carefully with proper consideration of the detail of what that replacement is. I, I think that is um, an argument uh, that most people will, will understand. Um, on the question of what will happen in terms of exams next year, uh, if I was to stand here right now uh, and give, while we are still in uh, the grip of uh, COVID, uh, where we have rising cases, although uh, increasing vaccination, that we hope will keep that under control. If I was to stand here in an knee-jerk, uh, ill-considered way, decide now what is to happen uh, for exams next year, then I think people across the country would be right to criticise me for doing that. That would not be the responsible, considered thing to do instead. And the Education Secretary set this out in Parliament. Uh, we will consider this uh, as COVID develops over the summer and we will set that out in August so that schools as they return know what uh, the situation is going to be. Again, uh, I think the responsible way to proceed. And finally, Presiding Officer, uh, the OECD report is uh, an important publication and I think every uh, member of this parliament I know has and will continue to pay close attention to it but let me just provide some balance and some context that if we were only to listen to Mr Ross would be completely and utterly uh, lacking so everything I'm about to say now is quoting from the OECD report curriculum for excellence continues to be a bold and widely supported initiative um, it is an inspiring example equated with good curriculum practice. 
Scotland is ranked amongst higher than average country performance on international assessments, uh, usually scoring at or above OECD average in mathematics, reading and science. Uh, education is a source of pride in Scotland. So yes, there are challenges to be addressed. There are reforms that are needed and this government will take them forward. But opposition uh, leaders, I think, occasionally should recognise the strengths in the Scottish education system for the benefit of young people across our country. Douglas Ross. The OECD report. The... Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear Mr Ross. Thank you. The OECD report is so important and so crucial that Nicola Sturgeon kept it in her drawer over the election period to make sure there could be no challenge on her government's shambolic record uh, in education. And of course, in all the quotes uh, that she read out there, she didn't read out the one from the OECD report that said confusing and unhelpful communication had been given to schools. That one slipped the briefing from the First Minister. But she also says she can't stand up and give a definitive answer to young people whether they will face exams or not next year. And that would be irresponsible. Yet the First Minister stood up at that desk earlier on this week to give us as a country a route map out of restrictions. So on one hand, we know how we get out of the restrictions of COVID-19, but young people are left in limbo with no answers as to whether they will... Uh, set traditional exams or not next year. But let's have a look at what Scotland's experts on education are saying about this. Keir Bloomer, who helped write the curriculum for excellence, said, if the government go too far, we will see a fall in standards. And Edinburgh University professor Lindsay Patterson said, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry that the Deputy First Minister of Scotland and a Scottish Government Minister are criticising an independent expert in education before I am even able to say... And John Swinney has the gall to nod his head. Perhaps if he had listened to Lindsay Patterson, he wouldn't have been sacked as Education yeah. Secretary. Because Lindsay Patterson said... It is unlikely that a system that relied wholly on co coursework would ever command public confidence. Scottish Conservatives firmly believe that traditional exams are the best and fairest way for young people to show what they know and what they can do. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. I, I agree that we have to get all of this right and traditional exams, absolutely, we have to consider their place in the future of qualifications very carefully. No decisions have been taken around that and one of the reasons no decisions have been taken around that is we're awaiting a further report from the OECD in August which will help to inform those decisions going forward. I, I don't know whether Douglas Ross was just unaware of that but there uh, we go. Um, on the many questions there, I'm going to quickly run through all of them. Um, I am not shying away from the tough message in the OECD report uh, and we have accepted all of the recommendations of the OECD report and I think that is evidence of that. The timing of the report, I know Douglas Ross wasn't a member of this parliament before the election but this was canvassed fairly extensively before the election. The timing of the publication of the OECD report was entirely a matter for the independent OECD and before the election some of the correspondence uh, was actually uh, put into spice so that members could see what the OECD were saying about that had we against the wishes actually I'll put it a bit more strongly than that against the instruction of the OECD published the report anyway uh, then I'm sure the Conservatives would have been amongst the first to get to their feet to criticise us for going against an independent organisation. In terms of exams next year this is a really important decision. What I set out um, on Tuesday was a contingent route map. I very much hope that we can meet those deadlines and get the country back to normal. But decisions around things like uh, exams next year will be dependent to, on whether or not we can meet those milestones. It is right and proper and essential that we take these decisions in proper order. There have been many young people having to self-isolate over the last few weeks. We want to hopefully reduce uh, that as we go into the new academic term uh, but we have to take account of the wider COVID situation and take these decisions uh, properly so that's what we will continue to do and I think as I say whether people agree or disagree with the ultimate decisions that is uh, the way in which people would want us to approach it and finally presiding officer I don't ignore the comments of Lindsay Patterson or Keir Bloomer we take account of those views and comments as we do a range of views and comments uh, so let me just offer some others uh, the parents group connect uh, pleased that the OECD team could see that education is a source of pride 
in Scotland, uh, and that there is a huge commitment to improving children's lives through education. Uh, the NASUWT uh, looking forward to working with the government to build on the many strengths the OECD has rightly identified. The Scottish Youth Parliament uh, saying that it offers Scottish education uh, an opportunity going forward. Uh, so there is a variety of views. Uh, the OECD had many good things to say about the strengths of Scottish education, and actually it is possible to recognise that while also saying uh, that there are real challenges to address and to overcome, uh, and this government is going to do both. And actually, it's that prospectus that we put before the Scottish people just a few weeks ago and were roundly re-elected to deliver on. Douglas Ross. So on the specific question of the future of exams in Scotland, the First Minister said, and I wrote this down to quote her correctly, she will consider their place in education going forward. After being in government for 14 years, First Minister for seven, and having pledged education would be her number one priority, I think people across Scotland will expect the First Minister to be able to quite clearly say if she is for or against exams. But she absolutely did not in that answer. Her government no longer seems to value traditions that have served us well, that helped the First Minister and I get from a great local school to this parliament. Our education system has always been distinct. It's uniquely our own, a cornerstone of what makes us Scottish. If the SNP remove the focus on fundamentals, if they stop valuing core knowledge, if they ditch exams, isn't her government abandoning the very things that made Scotland schools great? First Minister. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we finally got an admission uh, from Douglas Ross that Scotland schools are great. Um, so at least we're making some progress. Look, I'll try and say this uh, more straightforwardly. I think exams uh, are important, um, but uh, and firstly, I have been with my colleagues, been in government for 14 years, but presiding officer, the only reason I'm still in government, standing here as first minister, because a matter of weeks ago, uh, the Scottish people re-elected me in a landslide election victory. So they've taken account of all of this and decided that they trust uh, this government to take uh, Scotland forward in all of these matters. On the issue of exams, what I think is the, the most important principle is that we, like any country, have a robust uh, and respected system uh, for awarding qualifications to young people. But it is the case, whether I like it or not, that there is a debate in Scotland right now about what the correct balance between traditional exams and continuous assessment is in ensuring that we have that robust system. Uh, we've asked the OECD to do further work. They will report to us in August. We will take account of all of that. And this parliament then uh, will have the opportunity to debate this. Uh, the core principle here, though, is the quality of the system uh, that gives young people qualifications. And, and that is the outcome we should all be focused on. And we shouldn't fear uh, a real debate about the best way of doing that. So that's what we will take forward. And we look forward to views right across this parliament. Thank you. Before we move to question two, I would ask members, um, wherever possible, to ask succinct questions and for shorter responses. That will enable us to include more members in proceedings. And I call Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, the government has previously communicated well during this pandemic, but that has started to slip, risking public trust and confidence. In recent weeks, we have allowed 3,000 football fans to attend a fan zone but said parents can't attend an outdoor sports day. Trampoline centres can open, but soft plays can't. Hospitality venues can open late for penalties, but the government says it's not safe on other days. And we've had an avoidable public argument between the Scottish Government and the Mayor of Greater Manchester. If we are to navigate the coming months, communications have to be clear and decisions consistent. The government's own polling says one in five people don't know what's expected of them. That's before these decisions. We now have the hospitality sector, the aviation sector, the wedding industry, retailers, children's play centres and more all speaking out and expressing frustration. So will the First Minister change your approach, engage and listen to them and have a can-do approach to this new stage of our pandemic response? First Minister. Um, I, I, I... What I will do is avoid uh, easy slogans like can-do approach. Um, I, I think it's really important that we continue to move forward cautiously. Uh, we all want to get back to normal. We have a greater degree of normal normality than we've had almost at any time in the past 15 months. 
uh, but there is a further distance to travel. But we have to do that carefully. We can see uh, case, numbers, uh, case numbers today, which of course will be published this afternoon, show another just short of 3,000 cases uh, reported over the course of yesterday. Positivity rate of, uh, I think, 7.7%. So these are uh, rising case numbers and we've got to be cautious. Communication is really important. Communication as you come out of restrictions and things get uh, hopefully easier in many ways, but more complicated, then communication is more challenging and nobody knows that better uh, than I do. I will continue to do my level best uh, to communicate clearly with people the reasons why uh, certain decisions are being taken and why some things uh, can happen and other things can, even although that appears to be inconsistent. And as I uh, make use of uh, the media briefings uh, over the summer uh, recess presiding officer that I think have stood the country in good stead over the past 15 months, I, I hope that I won't hear um, any further criticism for that from uh, Anna Sarwar's deputy, as I have at many points over the past uh, few months, because I agree uh, communication to the public is, is important. Uh, many of these things uh, that Anna Sarwar has talked about are, are decisions we reach for pragmatic reasons. The, the issue of opening times uh, during uh, football matches that might go to penalties is to avoid people crowding out of pubs at the same time uh, while they're still wanting to watch football. It's actually about trying to avoid a risk in a pragmatic way. Similarly with the fan zone, it's about trying to make sure that there is an environment that is relatively safe because of the regulations, recognising that no matter what I say, uh, people want to watch the football. Uh, so these things can be, I understand, really difficult for people to understand, to, to accept, and, and I do understand that. But this is possibly one of the most difficult phases of this pandemic as we try to navigate our way from here back to, to normality, but knowing that there are still a lot of risks that we've got to try to to avoid and get round. And the last thing I would say is every single decision we take, although the decisions are the government's and I take responsibility for them, uh, but they are all informed by clinical advice so that we try to get them as right as we possibly can. Anna Sarwar. I, I think the First Minister misses the point. The can-do approach is not about some kind of slogan. It's speak to individual businesses. Every single member will have walked down the Royal Mile to come into the Parliament. And they'll have seen businesses how frustrated they are. That's what I mean by having a can-do approach. Because behind every business, there are people trying their best to get by. People like Cammy Hudson. Cammy has built a successful wedding photography business. Last year, he was meant to have 49 weddings. Instead, he had just six. He says the government doesn't understand his industry, are following a one-size-fits-all approach and refusing to listen. And he's not alone. This year's bookings are all but gone. And because of the uncertainty, people are choosing to book as far as 2023. Cammy can't afford to turn down a job. That's why two weeks ago, he found himself driving from Brighton to Inverness overnight in order to accommodate two bookings. That meant 39 hours straight awake, working two 10-hour shifts and being forced to drive 600 miles through the night. That is an unacceptable situation for anyone to be in, having to risk his own health in order to put food on the table and pay the bills. Does the First Minister think that is acceptable? First Minister. Um, if you're asking me, do I think any of this is acceptable? No, I don't. I don't think it is acceptable that any of us are having to live through a global pandemic. Every single impact of this is horrendously difficult for the people who are having to bear it. So I'm not going to stand here and try to, uh, to, to defend uh, the horrible situations people find themselves in. Uh, but what I will say is nobody is doing this to people deliberately or for any reason other than to try in a really difficult situation to keep the country as safe as possible. And we listen uh, as we go. We are in a much greater degree of normality now. The shops in the Royal Mile just uh, a matter of uh, weeks ago were completely closed, now open, of course. Of course, trading is not completely normal because people, apart from anything else, still have a degree of nervousness and we have to encourage uh, the whole country back to normality, but give them a sense of safety as that happens. On weddings, weddings have been, uh, the wedding sector, um, and we talk about the sector economically, that's really important, but for many couples having to postpone and re-postpone weddings, this has been one of the most difficult impacts and we listen. Uh, so, for example, uh, just yesterday, a request has been made by uh, one, the representative body in the wedding sector to say if we go to level zero on the 19th of July can we uh, bring that uh, forward to the 16th so that the weddings that weekend can go forward we are actively considering things like that so that we are trying to be as 
flexible. But on the other hand, we know that some uh, outbreaks have originated, understandably, in uh, life event type settings when families are coming together and, and hugging and, and doing these kind of things. And, and they therefore, unfortunately, this is the painful thing about COVID. It's these kind of things that pose the greatest risk. Um, I, like everybody else does, I hate every aspect of this. Um, I hate every decision we have to make that restricts people's ability to live their lives. And no part of me wants to do it for a second longer than necessary. I don't think these decisions, I know these decisions are not easy. I don't pretend that we get every single one of them right. Um, I know we don't because of the nature of what we're trying to do here. But we try to get them right, we listen and we rectify when we are clear we've got something wrong. Um, and that's what we'll continue to try to do. And if all of us continue to pull together, uh, that day when we can lift all restrictions, I do believe is now within sight. But getting from here to there still involves us being cautious and careful. And I know how difficult that is, but I also know how necessary it is. Anna Sarwar. Look, I, I accept we have to be cautious and careful. I, I'm not saying the Scottish Government needs to defend the decision. I'm not saying the decisions are deliberate. But the First Minister can say she's listening, but the businesses don't believe she's listening. They think she's telling them what they need to do rather than actually engaging with them. She gave the example of the Scottish Wedding Industry Alliance. They themselves said that the decisions don't go far enough and the government is still not communicating effectively with them. Because this is a bit more than financial support. These are businesses and individuals that have spent 15 months working out how to operate safely. It's different if it was just one sector. It's more than just one sector. Sector after sector are now speaking out publicly about the government's poor communication and inconsistent decision making. The government's current approach is not working for this stage of the pandemic, and it needs to change. We all started this parliament saying we would focus on recovery. That work has to start now. The vaccine is working, and we have spent the last year building up our testing and our tracing capacity. So will the government change their approach, have a can-do attitude demanded by people across the country, stop the inconsistency, get round the table, engage with these businesses and individuals, and start the important work of rebuilding our country? First Minister. John, John Swinney was round the table with these stakeholders this morning. We, we do that regularly and we'll continue to do that. We listen. Uh, I readily concede that there will be many things that business ask us to do that we consider and can't do. And the reason for that is not because we're not listening. The reason for that is down to the one thing, no matter how much I wish I could, I cannot do. And that is simply magic away this virus. I can't, if, if I could do that, I would do it in an instant. So we have to continue to take careful decisions. Uh, Anna Sarwar says the vaccines are working. All of the evidence says the vaccines are working. Uh, and we are vaccinating as fast as supplies allow. But we continue to have, although it's reducing every day, a significant proportion of the population that is not yet fully vaccinated. Um, that is why cases are going up again. Uh, I've just said 2,999 cases from yesterday will be reported today. Uh, we hope that will not translate into hospital admissions in the way that kind of case number would have earlier in the year because of the vaccine. But I said, uh, reported to this parliament earlier this week, that 10% of cases uh, were uh, translating into hospital admissions earlier this year. It's now down to 5%. That is really, really positive news. But 5% of a daily case rate of 3,000 is still a massive number yeah. heading into our hospitals. That's loss for people. That's pain and suffering as well as pressure on the NHS. Yeah. So this phase is the most difficult phase because we are on the route back to normality. We can see uh, hopefully the finishing line in August. But getting from here to there demands care and caution because uh, what will be determined by how we behave in the short term is not whether we get to that finishing line. The vaccines are going to get us there. I am confident of that. But what will be determined is how many more lives are lost between now and then, uh, how much pressure we put on our National Health Service and how many more families have to suffer the pain that too many have suffered already. I, uh, my heart breaks for every business, every individual, every uh, sector of our society that is still suffering from COVID. COVID. But I don't do my job properly uh, by rushing decisions that will make the situation worse. I do my job properly, no matter how difficult these decisions are, by trying to get us safely to that end point. And that's what I'm going to dedicate every day to doing until we're at it. Well, question number three, Lorna Slater. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, ITN revealed that the Amazon warehouse in Dunfermline is destroying millions of new unsold items, including televisions, laptops, and face covering. 
This level of waste is obscene. In 2020 alone, Amazon's net profits were over $20 billion. It is a company that has refused to pay the living wage, uses zero-hour contracts, and keeps its workers in such a state of desperation that some of them are reduced to sleeping in tents. It is a company that has resisted trade unions and avoids paying corporation tax. The Scottish Greens have previously challenged the millions of pounds of public money given to Amazon through Scottish Enterprise. In the last financial year, the Scottish Government gave them £4.7 million for web services. Can the First Minister tell us when her government will stop giving Amazon money? First Minister. Uh, we attach, uh, as uh, Lorna Slater knows, and as many uh, rightly across the Chamber have uh, called for, and we increasingly attach fair work conditions to all of the uh, grant support that Scottish Enterprise uh, or any of our enterprise agencies uh, give. I don't have in front of me. I'm happy to look into the details of uh, the particular support that Lorna Slater has uh, referenced and uh, look at what conditions, what exactly that was for and what conditions are attached uh, to that. So we will continue to make sure that any taxpayer money that is going to business is about creating not just creating jobs but creating fair uh, jobs and that companies are being challenged as well as supported. On the broader point about Amazon, clearly I'm not responsible for the practices of Amazon but we you know, we had a, a report just yesterday from Zero Waste about uh, consumption and about the need to become much more sustainable as a country and as a society. We all have a duty to do that, but companies certainly do, uh, and destroying uh, things in the way that has been reported this week, I do think, uh, raises real questions uh, about the acceptability of that. Lorna Slater. Thank you, First Minister. Only yesterday, the Minister told me that he wants to see public money going to companies that treat their employees well. Public money should be going to small companies and those who need it to recover from the pandemic. At the heart of this obscene level of waste is an economy that puts a disposable, throwaway culture ahead of the needs of people and planet. It is shocking that a company of this size would rather destroy new items than give them away to people in need. This shocking revelation underlines that governments must do more to force companies to reduce waste with regulation and fines where they are failing to act. Will the First Minister commit to enshrining the circular economy in robust laws that will prevent such needless volumes of waste in the future? First Minister. Well, I think our commitments to a circular economy and, and legislating for a circular economy are, are known, and I look forward to taking that forward uh, with cooperation across uh, the Parliament. Um, I agree with the comments in terms of what's been reported about Amazon. Uh, I do think governments have to do more to persuade uh, everybody to lead by example, to persuade individuals and certainly to persuade uh, companies to cut down on waste and to become much more responsible environmentally more generally. But I, I don't think any company the size and scale of Amazon should need a government to tell it that it shouldn't be destroying uh, large amounts of things uh, that could actually be, and Lorna Slater is right, given uh, to people in need. So I would hope Amazon will uh, reflect very carefully on that. Uh, there's, a, there's a big challenge for all governments right across the world uh, on this and Scotland, I hope, will lead by example. And similarly on fair work, I, as I say, I'm, I'm not sure uh, the detail of the, the financial support, whether it is a grant or uh, perhaps procurement for services or something like that. I'll look into that. Uh, but it is really important that we attach fair work conditions to any support uh, that government is giving companies. Question number four, Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government, the Post Office and CJ Lang regarding the proposed closure of 31 Post Office branches across Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, this unfortunate decision, and I think it is uh, that, to rule out a programme of post office closures uh, up until February next year is a commercial one uh, made by CJ Lang and Son. Uh, as postal services, of course, are a reserve matter, uh, the Scottish Government wasn't involved in this decision-making process, but the Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth recently met with Post Office Limited to seek assurances around continuity of services to any community affected by closure. Uh, he also met representatives from uh, CJ Lang and Son to seek assurances around the remaining post office branches within their sparse stores and confirm that no job losses will be suffered as a result of these closures. Neil Gray. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Yesterday I wrote to the post office on behalf of a cross-party group of MSPs and MPs asking the post office to do all it can 
to engage quickly with CJ Lang to see if any of these 31 spar-based branches can be saved. This is especially important for communities like Allenton and my Adrian Shots constituency, where the spar store is the only realistic option for a post office branch. So, will the First Minister therefore agree to continue doing what she can to quickly bring both players and the UK Government, who has responsibility, to the table and look at all options to save these crucial post offices across Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to agree to do that. Uh, I, I certainly agree that these proposed closures will have a big impact on their local communities. And I certainly would urge all parties involved, including the UK Government, to look at the matter again. As I mentioned in my previous answer, there has already been ministerial contact uh, with senior representatives, both from CJ Lang and the Post Office. Um, but we will make sure that those contacts continue uh, and bring people together to explore uh, what is possible. Um, Scottish Government officials also continue to have regular dialogue with officials in the UK Government and Post Office Limited around this issue more generally, and I have asked to be kept fully updated on them. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to curb the decline of iconic woodland bird species in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, addressing the, the twin challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change uh, is a central priority for the Government. Uh, while the Index of Abundance for Scottish Terrestrial Breeding Birds shows that the long-term trend for woodland birds in Scotland is increasing, and it is likely that this will continue as we deliver our targets to expand forest cover and create new native woodland, population numbers for some woodland bird species do continue to be a concern. Uh, we have been taking action to address this, uh, for example, by providing specific support for Capper Cayley from the Forestry Grant Scheme uh, between 2016 and 2025, and also funding through the previous Rural Priority Schemes Capper Cayley package. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. First Minister, nature is under threat. It is not just the Capper Cayley. It is our waders, our plovers, our curlews. And your government has failed to meet 11 of the 20 key biodiversity targets. Farmers have told me that they can be a part of the solution to this climate change crisis. And your government has sat on their hands for too long. There is a climate emergency. The custodians of our land are key to protect and meet these biodiversity targets. So today, will she commit to give clarity on agricultural policy? And will she ensure biodiversity targets are improved by extending the agri-environment climate scheme beyond 2024 to protect these iconic bird species? First Minister. I, I think this is a really important issue. Um, it is the case that for some species uh, there is real cause for concern, and I have recognised that. It is also the case, uh, just as a, a matter of fact, that for other uh, species we are seeing uh, an increase, uh, for some increases of over uh, 400 per cent. Uh, but it is important that where there are uh, declines, and, and the biggest long-term increase, which is more than 50 per cent, is for Capper Cayley. Um, but in, on the specifics, uh, obviously we consider funding both in the short term and the long term to make sure we are supporting these objectives. Uh, we face right now a climate and a biodiversity crisis. They are obviously very closely linked. And this government is very serious about addressing both of them, doing what we need to do here, but in doing that, also setting an example for the rest of the world. And I hope that the question and the tone of the question, which I welcome, is a, a signal that when it comes to the, the detail of what is needed uh, to meet these things, we will have perhaps more than we have had in the past support from the Scottish Conservatives instead of what we've seen recently, uh, which is scale mongering around you know talks with the greens about what that might mean instead of all of us actually instead of all of us actually recognizing that this i know the conservatives don't like it when we actually talk about the detail of some of this stuff but instead of instead of willing instead of willing the ends uh, we have to be prepared to do the means and that is harder it is often controversial but i hope this question as i say and the tone of it i really welcome uh, it signals a change of heart from the scottish conservatives question number six jackie bailey to ask the first minister how the scottish government is supporting the nhs in light of reports of wards being full and an increase in patients with serious and complex conditions first minister Remobilising and supporting the NHS is uh, one of the top priorities for this and I'm sure for governments across uh, the UK and indeed in terms of health services for governments across the world. Uh, we will shortly publish our NHS recovery plan which will set out how we will continue to support patients to receive the highest quality of care and expand NHS capacity. 
The pandemic has had a significant impact on the ability of the NHS to operate normally for the past 15 months, and that has consequences. Uh, but I want to thank our NHS staff for the work they continue to do to make sure people in need of urgent care get that. And they are also working flat out to get care and treatment to people who saw it delayed due to COVID. To help staff, uh, a range of wellbeing and mental health uh, resources has been put in place locally, which staff tell us they value. These services are supplemented by national resources, such as the National Wellbeing Hub, uh, which has uh, more than 100,000 users. Um, and we will continue to put in place the support that staff require. Jackie Bailey. Um, I welcome the NHS recovery plan being on its way, but these problems are happening now. Consultants in A&E are seeing more people with more chronic and undiagnosed conditions presenting as emergencies. They warn that medical beds are at 120 to 130% capacity, and that has an impact on elective surgery, and the number of people waiting over a year for operations has almost doubled. Activity is below pre-pandemic levels, which is understandable, but in some areas there are simply not enough hospital beds to cope with even those admissions. So what is the First Minister's response to staff who are worried that they do not have the capacity to treat all the patients coming through the door? First Minister. So the NHS uh, generally is getting uh, much closer now uh, to pre-pandemic uh, capacity. Many parts of the NHS are beyond that. Jackie Bailey cited one, uh, you know, attendances at A&E, for example, have gone beyond that, above uh, what they were going into the pandemic. Uh, cancer referrals, uh, for example, uh, urgent suspicion of cancer referrals are now 120% compared to April uh, last year. So we are supporting the NHS. This is a difficult task particularly for those on the front line, uh, to make sure that the balance between COVID and non-COVID treatment is where it needs to be. Uh, the one thing I would say, and I, I say this genuinely because it relates back to my exchanges with Anna Sarwar earlier on, one of the big challenges we have right now is to make sure uh, that we continue to manage COVID in a way that doesn't distract from the efforts of the NHS to deal with the backlog and get back to normal. And last year when we talked about not overwhelming our NHS, uh, at that point we had pretty much set aside the whole capacity of the NHS. Um, right now, that's different. The NHS is getting back to normal, so the margins around that are much tighter. And that's why, in answer to Anna Sarwa's Sarwa question, why don't we just get back to normal in more areas more quickly, is because we have to take great care not to allow cases to rise in a way that uh, generates more hospital admissions from COVID and sets back the recovery plan. This is all really important stuff, but it's also really complex stuff. And that balance right now is very sensitive, which is one of the main reasons why we continue, difficult though it is, and difficult though it is for uh, many sectors, that we have to continue to be cautious as we navigate our way through these next few weeks. Move on to supplementaries. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to high numbers of do not attends at COVID-19 vaccination clinics and whether the Government are exploring innovative ways for vaccination team staff to contact those being vaccinated, such as text messaging, which could help ensure vaccine attendance? And I remind Chamber that I am a member of NHS of Fries and Galloway's vaccination team. First Minister. Um, can I take the opportunity, first of all, President Officer, again, to thank everybody in our vaccination teams across the country. And I'm taking that opportunity generally, but also because Emma Harper is a member of our vaccination team and as well as her responsibilities in this parliament has been vaccinating people. So thank you to her, uh, as well as the many others across uh, the country. Um, this is obviously one of the key priorities around the vaccination programme, given the stage it's at. The Health Secretary and I were uh, engaged in a meeting earlier this morning uh, about this very issue. The, the first thing to say is that uh, uptake rates are very high, exceptionally high, and that is a really positive thing. Uh, they are slightly lower the further down the age spectrum we come, but still much higher than previous vaccination programmes. Uh, so we are looking now, uh, given that we're at, at an advanced stage, at the different ways in which we can uh, get people who, for whatever reason, haven't attended an appointment to now attend. So we're looking at more uh, drop-in facilities uh, to look at more use of texts and, uh, and technology. Young people who registered on the portal will be getting their appointment by text already, uh, but we need to go back and do a sweep to try and uh, get to the people who haven't attended. So to reassure Emma Harper and the Chamber, there is a lot of work over the next few weeks we'll go into uh, getting as many people vaccinated um, as possible. If you look at uh, 
very briefly, presiding officer, case numbers right now. One of the factors Scotland is, is dealing with right now, and you see this in the ONS survey that's published weekly, is because we have generally over the last 15 months, we've had uh, lower infection rates. Uh, we've also got lower population immunity. So there's more of our population that is still susceptible. What does that mean? It means it's even more important for us to get as many people as possible vaccinated. So that is a key priority that uh, all of us in the Scottish Government are absolutely focused on. Jamie Green to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Uh, figures released this week tell a horrendous story of domestic abuse in Scotland, which has risen for the fourth year in a row, with some 63,000 incidents last year. Uh, second to our drug crisis in Scotland, this too is our national shame. Education and prevention, of course, are important, but First Minister, so is punishment. So let me ask, how many perpetrators who would have historically received a custodial sentence did not under the government's presumption against short sentences? Because if the answer is more than one person, we really have to ask ourselves, what message does that send to the tens of thousands of victims of abuse, mostly women, about whose side justice is really on? First Minister. Can I, well, firstly, say, and I, I think every single one of us would agree with this, one uh, case of domestic abuse is one too many. We should have a, a zero tolerance approach and, and that is the approach the Scottish Government uh, brings. There is an important point of context here um, that I think it is really important for all of us to understand. Uh, if we look at the uh, year 2019-20, uh, the figures that were reported last month, more than half of the rise in convictions uh, were actually accounted for by the new offences under the new uh, Domestic Abuse Act. So, in actual fact, uh, it is because we have legislated to make more domestic abuse behaviour a criminal offence yeah. that we're seeing those numbers go up. So, nobody should ever celebrate the rise in uh, cases of domestic abuse, but actually underlying these statistics is a sign that as a country, as a parliament, we have taken this even more seriously. Uh, Marsha Scott from Scottish Women's Aid, indeed, I'm um, quoting her here, although it's very early data, our new domestic abuse law shows signs of living up to its global gold standard label. Um, in terms of uh, punishments, uh, as Jamie uh, Green knows, and you know, we've had debates in other contexts over the past few months about uh, whether the separation of powers between Parliament and the judiciary and the criminal justice system are as robust as they should be. I think they are. But every member of this Parliament should know that I do not decide what punishment somebody gets once they are convicted uh, of an offence. Yes, we set uh, the statutory framework for that, but in terms of short sentences, uh, actually this was in the, the question uh, that was posed to me, it is a presumption against short sentences. The decision about whether or not any perpetrator goes to jail is not a decision for me or any member of the government. It is a decision for the judge presiding over that case. And that is the way it should always be. Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to ask the First Minister for her reaction to the outcome of the court case taken to the court of session by survivors of people who suffered abuse at the hands of the Society of Sailors. This case failed because the court determined that a defence could not be mounted because those who allegedly perpetrated that abuse have since died. That would seem to set a new and a frankly impossible threshold for many survivors of child abuse. So can I ask what impact does this have on the considerations for the government as it sets up Redress Scotland, given that it may increase the scope of those that will need to seek uh, compensation through this scheme. Can I ask, does she agree with me that these organisations should understand that the moral threshold may be considerably lower than the legal threshold for them to meet and agree with survivors and agree compensation you, for those who suffered abuse when these organisations should have been caring for them? Thank you. First Minister. Um, I, I hope my answer will be helpful, but um, if... Uh, as for reasons I'm sure Daniel Johnson will understand, I'm, I'm going to not uh, rush to give too detailed an answer to this because obviously with a, a judgment from a court, the government wants to take time to consider that and to consider the implications uh, properly. I'd say two things though in response to his question. Uh, firstly, I absolutely agree, and this is not me trying to second guess decisions of courts, that would be wrong for me to do that. But in terms of how he phrased it about the moral threshold, I absolutely agree with the sentiments lying behind that question. Uh, the uh, instances of, of 
systemic child abuse that the inquiry, of course, is, is currently look at, looking at should shame uh, all of us as a country um, and the redress, not just in a financial sense, but in a wider sense that we owe to people um, is a really serious obligation. And I think uh, that phraseology of moral threshold uh, to stand aside any legal or financial threshold is, is one that is important for all of us to recognise. The second point is the threshold for the redress scheme is already uh, low, but one of the things, of course, we will have to consider in terms of considering the, uh, the judgment is, is whether there are any implications for that. And on that more detailed uh, point, I am happy to ask the Deputy First Minister to write to the member once we've had the opportunity to look in detail at it. John Mason to be followed by Russell Finlay. Thank you. We understand that UK food and drink exports are down 47 per cent uh, to the EU in the first quarter. Also, that Scotland's GDP could fall by £9 billion by 2030. So, after COVID, can I ask the First Minister, should the people of Scotland have the choice between a disastrous Tory Brexit and friendly relations with all European nations? First Minister. Uh, yes, of course they should, not just because I think they should, but because that's what people in Scotland voted for in an election a few weeks ago. Uh, but not only do I think they should, uh, I am determined that they will. Um, and that is an important choice for people in Scotland to make. The impact of Brexit is only now starting to hit home. For people, uh, the uh, evidence that John Mason has cited about the fallen exports is uh, serious and damaging to businesses uh, across much of our country. Uh, there are many other uh, impacts. I uh, visited some EU nationals yesterday who are having to go through the indignity of applying to stay in their own country. I spoke to young, one young woman, and this, for me, in some ways sums up uh, the deep injustice of Brexit. A young woman uh, who came to this country uh, at three years old from Germany, has spent periods of her life in the care system here. Uh, you listen to her, you would not think she was anything other than Scottish. She is Scottish, as Scottish as I am. But because at three years old, she came from Germany, she is now having to go through the process of applying to stay in her own country. I can't find the words to say how offended and angry that makes me on behalf of every EU national living in our country. I don't think that's who we are as a country in Scotland. So yes, uh, after we are uh, through uh, this COVID uh, crisis, I do think we should have the opportunity to decide if we want to be governed by Brexit Tories or if we want to be governed as a country uh, by governments we elect ourselves based on the values that most of us in Scotland hold dear. Russell Finlay to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you. The family home of Councillor Graham Campbell has been targeted on three occasions. The most recent attack came last weekend when his cars and home were torched. Graham and his wife count themselves lucky to have survived. He believes these cowardly attacks are linked to organised crime. And he tells me that he now has no option but to quit politics. Will the First Minister condemn organised crime mob rule in Scotland? and tell Parliament what the Scottish Government is doing about this attack on democracy. First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I don't just uh, unreservedly um, condemn organised crime. I unreservedly and unequivocally condemn the attacks on Councillor Campbell uh, and his wife. I can't imagine uh, what they have been through uh, facing these attacks, and I'm sure the thoughts of everybody across, not just the chamber, but across the country are with them. And I want to send uh, him and his wife a message of solidarity from me and from my party today. Um, these uh, matters have to be treated with the utmost seriousness. Nobody, uh, for whatever reason, should feel that they have no choice but to leave politics or to uh, abandon any part of their life because of threats or attacks from organised crime or anywhere else. Uh, it is, of course, not for me or the government, it's for the police uh, to investigate and hopefully bring to justice those who have uh, perpetrated these attacks. And I offer my full support to the police uh, and the actions they will be taking to do that. But uh, for the purposes of today, uh, I want to reiterate that message of solidarity to Councillor Campbell and his family. Ross Greer to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Next month, the BBC will make a final decision on the proposal to transfer ownership of its Glasgow Pacific Key studios to a subsidiary company. Staff have been warned that this could result in dozens of redundancies and no to pay transfer. There are wider concerns across the Scottish production sector that it will restrict access to the studios as decisions over that access will be made from London. Can I ask the First Minister what representation the government's made to the BBC about this proposal and if a government minister will meet with the Bechtel staff union to discuss how the jobs can be saved. 
First Minister. Uh, we make representations to the BBC on matters like this uh, regularly, uh, which of course have nothing to do with the editorial decisions of the BBC. But uh, for example, I uh, personally have made representations in the past about the need to build up uh, production capacity in Scotland for the, need, uh, for the BBC to spend more of the licence pay that Scottish uh, viewers pay uh, in Scotland, uh, supporting the economy and production opportunities here. So I absolutely share uh, the concerns that Ross Greer uh, has indicated. I hope this move doesn't go ahead. I, I I can't see and I haven't seen anything that would suggest to me it would be in the interests of, of Scotland uh, as a whole or the production sector in particular. And of course, yes, the uh, government would be happy to meet with a representative of BEC2. Uh, if that hasn't already been arranged, I'm sure that it can be uh, quickly. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. I declare my interest as a member of GMB Scotland. Uh, the First Minister is aware that Plaid is the owners of McVitie's factory in Glasgow have sadly issued redundancy notices to 500 workers. Some of them were here today with the union, the GMB, to present a petition to you, First Minister, of almost 75,000 petitioners. Um, I hope that the First Minister would be happy to take this petition um, from me on their behalf. I would like to put on record and commend the work of the Cabinet Secretary, Kate Forbes, and the working group, along with the trade unions, GMB and Unite. And I know the First Minister is fully behind this. Will the First Minister use her international recognition and skills that she has to eyeball directly the owners of McVitie's and put everything on the table that is possible to make sure that they are presented with an offer they cannot refuse? First Minister, I believe that you need to lead this charge and we will all, all be behind you in doing so. McVitie's factory in Glasgow cannot be allowed to close. First Minister. Um, as Polly McNeill is aware, the, the Finance Secretary, uh, with the leader of Glasgow City Council, uh, co-chairs uh, an action group uh, to try to save the McVitie's plant um, in the East End, which I am 100% uh, behind. Um, the Finance Secretary has also communicated uh, just this week, uh, or is communicating just this week, with Pladis uh, senior management to make very clear our disappointment at the lack of constructive engagement about the, the options uh, with Scottish Government support for saving uh, that site. We will not give up. Uh, we will do everything we possibly can. Uh, I will certainly do everything I can uh, to make sure uh, that any option there is uh, to save that plant, to save that site, to save those jobs uh, is taken forward by uh, the government. We cannot force uh, a company uh, to accept offers of help that we give, but we will do everything we can uh, to make sure uh, that those offers are credible um, and do everything to make sure that they are accepted. And, you know, that's what we've done uh, in the past, uh, you know, over other uh, industrial uh, plants and uh, often we then later on uh, get criticised for it when the opportunistic reasons uh, arise to allow that to happen uh, but that will not stop us doing everything we can to save this plant and to save uh, others that end up in a similar position. Um, on the petition, uh, Presiding Officer, one thing I would say, uh, the, the workers do not have to petition me and the Scottish Government, we are on their side and we will do everything we can to save their jobs. I will ensure, I uh, just to explain why I can't do it myself, I'm leaving uh, First Minister's questions to travel to our broth uh, to attend the funeral of one of our former members, uh, Andrew Welsh, and I want to take the opportunity today uh, to say, in uh, response to the passing of somebody widely respected across the political spectrum, how uh, much my thoughts are with his family. But I will arrange for another member of the government to, to accept the petition on my behalf. And finally, Beatrice Wishart. With many choosing to staycation this summer, the First Minister will be aware of reports that rural and island communities will see a significant number of domestic visitors. Many in the Isles will be worried about rising COVID infections across the country, including in Orkney and Shetland, and are concerned that testing is not being undertaken by those travelling. What can the Scottish Government do to ensure safe and sustainable domestic travel to all our islands and rural areas? First Minister. 
Well, I think this is a really important point. Our islands, uh, like the rest of the country, want to get back to normal. Tourism is a big part of normality for Scotland, um, and we want that for our islands. But it is really important that it is safe. That is why we have given very strong advice. We reiterate that regularly, and I will do so again today, to anybody travelling to our islands to test before they go. Lateral flow tests are available to allow them to do that. Uh, Beatrice Wisher is right to point this out. I can say that uh, in today's figures, there are uh, cases reported in both Orkney and Shetland. Very very small numbers, but it is a reminder that this virus has not gone away. So if you are travelling to our islands, travelling to any part of our beautiful country over the summer, please do so safely, test yourself, uh, respect all of the, the advice that is in place in any particular area uh, and help keep yourself and the local population safe. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions and I suspend this meeting until 2 p.m. Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can OK it unless it goes through London. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. There is now and forever what we know as the rape cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe in 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance stone. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European. And that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets.